thank you for that very nice introduction, uh, which boils down to, I'm from Washington and I'm here to help you. Uh, uh, it is actually nice to uh, take a day away from Washington, especially now, and uh, get out of uh, what has been the roughest of the rough and tumble of politics. Uh, which, uh, as it's played in Washington these days, means that one day you can be on top and the next day you're absolutely on the bottom. When you stumble, people are rarely there to lend a helping hand to pick you up. They are there to kick you in the ribs. Uh, in fact, I was discussing that on my way to uh, National Airport this morning with my cab driver, Dick Darman, and he agreed entirely. Uh, uh, Dick Darman, uh, of course, for those of you uh, who don't know, is the budget director under George Bush, and he's taken quite a beating, uh, and many of his Republican colleagues looking towards an election in uh, just 10 days uh, out on the run have begun to suggest that it will be Darmageddon out there in, in honor of him, uh, and uh, that's not the position you want to be in, that kind of notoriety. Uh, my subject, however, is uh, not uh, the budget per se, not uh, the budget director or the administration, it is the Congress. Uh, it is, in some respects, a difficult and painful time to talk about the Congress. Uh, the uh, uh, title of the lecture is uh, uh, basically a question. Is Congress a deliberative body or a bureaucracy? And I'm going to try to deal with that uh, question, going through what we mean by those two things and where we are and where we're heading. Uh, we're going to see a lot of attention paid to the Congress uh, in the rest of this election campaign and obviously in the uh, months and years that will follow. Uh, the, the public is not happy with its Congress right now. We have come, I think, uh, uh, closer than he ever imagined, uh, he being a, a congressman from Michigan, Bill Schutte, who's now running for the Senate, when he said inadvertently a few months ago, Congress is not the only suppository of wisdom. Uh, that's. Uh, the public might disagree with that right now uh, a little bit and suggest uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, they may hold that title alone. But we are obviously at a point where the normal public level of distaste with our Congress, which for 200 years has been high, it's uh, part of our cultural tradition, is even a little bit higher. I'll give you one small example. Uh, David Pryor is a senator from Arkansas, was uh, flying from New Orleans to Washington last week. Uh, and uh, he had as a seatmate on the plane, uh, just an average person who sat down next to him and they got into a conversation. And this fellow uh, sitting next to Senator Pryor started to uh, lament what was happening in Congress and what was going on in Washington and this budget process and all of the craziness. And he went on and on for a few minutes and then he turned to Pryor and he said, say, you don't have anything to do with that up there, do you? And Pryor said, well, actually I'm a United States Senator. Uh, this fellow said, looked at him with some amazement and said, uh, excuse me, I don't want to sit here anymore. And he got up and went and sat somewhere else on the plane. Uh, that is a true story. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it, it helps to explain why as this Congress uh, finally begins to prepare to pack its bags to go home, less than two weeks before the election, staying in Washington later than at any time in the entire post-war period before the election, they haven't been too unhappy to be there. Uh, they know that uh, in many of their communities, the public is out in the public square grumbling, but nobody has yet reached for the scaffold and the rope. And uh, as long as they keep a low profile, uh, maybe that's not going to happen. But they know the grumbling is taking place. Uh, the uh, jokes that have been around in the last couple of weeks about the Congress are uh, in the, in the uh, following genre. Saddam Hussein captures 100 members of Congress and says to George Bush that he's going to release them one at a time until his demands are met. Uh, all 535 members of Congress go out on a cruise as the term ends on the Potomac River uh, to uh, uh, celebrate the end of it. A sudden storm comes up and the boat capsizes. The question is asked, who is saved? The answer, the American public. Uh, that is uh, obviously not too far different from uh, a, uh, a country where uh, Mark Twain said there is no native criminal class in America except Congress, where Walter Winchell referred to uh, our uh, lower chamber as the House of Reprehensibles. Uh, we've seen this in our culture before, but obviously this is a time of particular bite in the criticism that's made of the institution. Now, is that made because Congress is 
not a deliberative body or has become a bureaucracy or for other reasons, well, let's examine that uh, for a few minutes at least. Uh, I started this task when uh, we uh, uh, ag agreed to terms here, to come here and to uh, give the lecture and I was uh, given a title and I thought about it some and I thought, well, the best way to start with this is to define what we mean. Now, deliberative. I went to my dictionary and there are several definitions of deliberative. If you think about one of those definitions and look at what's happened with the budget over the course of the last six months, where deliberative means to wait, to take your time, to avoid doing anything precipitous or taking any action, uh, this is perhaps the most deliberative Congress that we have ever had. Uh, they're still deliberating. Another continuing resolution today taking us through at least until Saturday. But obviously that's not quite what we had in mind or what uh, Cliff White and Brad Wilson and Peter Schramm and the others uh, here at the Ashbrook Center had in mind when we discussed the title for this lecture. They meant deliberative in another sense. Deliberative in the sense of careful debate and consideration, meaningful debate, deliberating over alternatives and different points of view before coming to uh, a decision. That's one clear characteristic of what we mean by a deliberative body. People getting together, talking face to face, debating major issues, getting points of view down, thinking through the consequences, the pros and cons, and the different courses of action that one might take. To have a truly deliberative body presumably also means that you have a body that's characterized by representativeness and the debate is representative. All points of view are represented and all forces uh, uh, that would be involved in decisions are represented. It also means acting in a deliberate fashion, although not quite in the same sense that I suggested right at the beginning. It seems to me that a deliberative body, as our framers conceived it, meant that we would have a Congress that would take no precipitous action, no panicky response to a public tantrum or a sudden concern that was raised that it might happen, uh, obviously, from time to time. and might happen particularly in the House of Representatives. But as we saw in one famous exchange between Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, they expected at least that the Senate would act as the saucer to cool the heat of the passion of the uh, coffee that uh, would be in it, perhaps from the House of Representatives, to keep the action from being uh, panicky and precipitous. Uh, now, do we meet those tests today? Well, uh, I would suggest that uh, obviously as we've defined it, uh, it would be very difficult to uh, uh, characterize Congress firmly uh, as a deliberative body right now. There has not been an enormous amount of meaningful debate, although as I will suggest to you in a few minutes, the debate may be more meaningful and may have been more meaningful in the last few years than we've seen in many other eras in American political life, including times when we look back through our rosy glasses at a halcyon time when we really did get true debate and it didn't quite occur there. Uh, in fact, I would make the case that with C-SPAN now, something that was greatly resisted by the Senate, televising the institution was something they thought would remove the last semblance of deliberate, uh, deliberativeness from uh, the chamber, has actually made floor debate in some respects a more meaningful uh, set of, uh, of uh, actions and a more meaningful process than it has been in many, many decades. Uh, and uh, that's uh, been true in the House of Representatives as well. And for any of you who now watch C-SPAN, the ability to see debates going on, which have had some uh, broad representation of different points of view, uh, much more homework by the members than ever used to be the case when they could get up and speak either off the cuff or as note cards were handed to them by staff with three sleepy reporters in the gallery and maybe a half dozen tourists. And if they messed up or said something absolutely ridiculous, that was the end of it. That just doesn't happen anymore. Somewhere, someplace, somebody's taping everything that goes on. And if you really mess up now, if you come in unprepared, if you simply rely on what a staffer is doing as that person sits there, uh, you are going to be embarrassed and it's going to come back to haunt you over and over again. So there's better preparation and more attention being paid. And indeed, if you spend time around Congress now, as I do quite a bit, you find a very different situation than occurred 15 years ago, say, or 20 years ago when I first came to the Hill, where uh, we had a pattern that had been in place 75 years earlier, 100 years ago now, that Woodrow Wilson wrote about in his famous book, Congressional Government, 
At Congress on the floor is Congress in, uh, at personal exhibition. Congress and its committees is Congress at work, uh, which remained true and still basically remains true. But back when I first came, more than 20 years ago, most members were off in committees or back in their offices working when things were going on on the floor, and they didn't have a clue as to what was happening on the floor. You go into an office now, or go into a committee room even, or go almost anywhere on the Hill and somewhere in the foreground or in the background, the proceedings on the floor are on, they're there. And if you go into offices of most members of Congress, House or Senate, they're watching. They're paying attention to what's happening on the floor uh, more than they have uh, in uh, most other times in history, at least going to the point where, or from the point where uh, roughly the turn of the, this past century, we built offices, office buildings, and every member got his or her own office uh, so that they didn't transact all of their business, including writing constituent letters or meeting with people right there on the floor of the chamber uh, itself. Uh, but that's not to say we have a deliberative body in the sense that the framers would have meant. Uh, at the same time, when I think of a, a deliberative body in terms of no panicky responses, I think about the last couple of years and the great paradox we have in Congress that as members get safer and safer and more and more ensconced in their seats, as their margins of victory get greater and greater, there is more of a sense of panic about every little hiccup out in the electorate and more of a reaction to that than I have seen in a long period of time. Consider, for example, the catastrophic health insurance program, which passed the Congress uh, in the 100th Congress, the last one that we had, and was entirely repealed. Every jot, every iota, uh, every paragraph and sentence and line and word the following year. That is almost unprecedented in American politics that you'd pass a major piece of legislation and entirely repeal it the next. And it was done largely because a very significant uh, but not terribly large group of senior citizens stood up and said no. Nobody stood up and said, well, yes. And they decided that rather than just simply correct some elements that brought that reaction, or say, let's give it a chance to work because it hasn't even been implemented yet, they turned in a panic and did what uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson thought would not happen, House and Senate combined, and erased the whole thing. Indeed, if you look at the budget agreement that was initially worked out this year by President Bush and the leaders of uh, both houses of Congress and both parties, that resulted in his first nationally televised address in support of uh, a, a position or a vote, uh, the president that is, that was of course uh, humiliatingly voted down by the House of Representatives. The single largest reason for that rejection was not taxes, it was Medicare, and it was the same group of senior citizens who said, not on our backs you won't, that brought a panicky reaction from people whose average margin of reelection is 70% and who, as we know, have a 98% reelection rate right now. The safer they get, the more skittish they get, the less deliberative they get in that sense. And it's a very interesting phenomenon that we have and one we might explore a little bit later uh, in our give and take. Now, let me turn to the other side of this for a couple of minutes. Uh, is Congress a bureaucracy? And what are some of the characteristics of a bureaucracy? I'm not gonna give you Max Weber's definition of a bureaucracy, but rather I have thought through what it means for a legislative body to be a bureaucracy and what would characterize it. Well, for a legislative body to be a bureaucracy, among other things, what you would expect is that there would be a strong continuity of membership with a great deal of seniority and a system built in that ensured that people moved up the ladder uh, through a set of regular rules into positions of leadership and characterized more by the permanence or constancy of its membership than by its turnover. A bureaucracy is an institution that would be dominated by routines, predictable patterns of behavior that would have a lot of tasks delegated out to staff that would have strong and enforceable norms of behavior. By those standards, Congress is in some respects a bureaucracy and in some respects far more than it has been in the past, in other respects less so. Is this a Congress dominated by the seniority of membership and of leadership positions? To a considerable degree, yes, but much less than we saw before. Contrary to the conventional wisdom that this is a Congress with less turnover than the Supreme Soviet, 
That may be true in general election campaigns, but if you have ever met with delegations from the Supreme Soviet or seen the Supreme Soviet, you know that the average age is about 70. Well, the average age in Congress is under 50, and the turnover in Congress has been and continues to be considerable. It's just not coming through the route we normally think of, which is incumbents getting defeated in re-election campaigns. A very comfortable majority of members of Congress, up near 60%, was first elected in the 1980s. The number of people who go back who are highly senior, who are geriatric, is exceedingly small, much less than it was when I first came to Washington in 1969, much less than it was 10, 15, 20 years before that, and it's been changing and uh, evolving with considerable amounts of turnover uh, ever since. It is true, we have seen much less of it. The kind of turnover that comes from retirement, death, resignation, or desire to run for another office and departure for those reasons, that uh, kind of turnover even has been less in the last couple of elections than we saw before that. But we had an enormous amount of turnover in the mid to late 1970s and in the early 1980s. Think of the turnover with that uh, Watergate election of 1974, with the beginning of a conservative revolt in 1978, with the Reagan revolution in 1980, with the uh, more modest but still considerable counter-revolution in 1982. All of that brought about a substantial amount of turnover that leads us to have an institution that doesn't have all that many people who have been around for the millennium. And if you think about who major committee chairmen are in both the House and Senate, they are characterized more by their youth than by their seniority. At the same time, when we look at where leadership is generally in the institution, we know that the seniority system, quote unquote, that custom that governed the ascension to positions of leadership uh, in Congress from roughly 1910 on for uh, more than uh, five decades, for almost six decades, has been changed. It hasn't been thrown out. Certainly seniority is still the single largest uh, factor in the ascension of individuals to positions of power. But it means much less. It is much less bureaucratic in that sense. People are voted on for their positions of influence every two years now in the Congress as a matter of routine. That's not what you would expect in the classic definition of a bureaucracy. Domination by routine, certainly there is a great deal of that. And in that sense, Congress is extraordinarily bureaucratic and perhaps more so, although predictable patterns of behavior, uh, I suppose if one predicts that something won't happen or it won't happen until the absolute last minute, one will get it right most of the time. But there's a lot more unpredictability in these patterns of behavior now than there used to be. Power has been decentralized and democratized to a very considerable degree in the last 20 years. However, we have also seen in the last six or eight a, a major attempt to re-centralize some of that power, to close some of the doors, to make things somewhat more predictable. There's a great deal of resistance to that. It's obvious from those votes in Congress where all the leaders got together and said, do this, and the rank and file members said, forget it, that it doesn't work as it did uh, in the past. There are many more people who have some power and some role to play uh, in these institutions. It is much less hierarchical and much flatter in terms of where authority goes, but there have been attempts to make it more routinized and to make it a little bit more bureaucratic in that sense, probably usefully so, and it leads us back to a useful observation that bureaucratic is often used entirely as a pejorative term. Uh, it shouldn't be. There are some things we want to make more bureaucratic, not less, uh, more predictable, not less, more uh, responsive to these kinds of considerations, not less. Now, in the more pejorative side, if we think about a bureaucracy as something that delegates many of its tasks to staff in this kind of an institution, obviously, Congress as a bureaucracy is radically different and radically more bureaucratized than it was at any time in the past. There are now roughly 37,000 people who are employed by the executive branch. Now, that doesn't mean they're all staffers of Congress. They simply get paychecks through the congressional appropriations process. The U.S. Botanic Gardens, the people who catalog books and movies in the Library of Congress, most of whom have nothing to do with Congress except they work on or near Capitol Hill, are also considered a part of this uh, major, massive machinery. But the people who work directly for the Congress, whether through the government account, general accounting office, 
the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress, the Office of Technology Assessment, uh, the uh, Congressional Budget Office, all research arms that have either been created or uh, expanded or energized in the last decade, the vast army of personal staffs in the House and Senate and the enlarged committee staffs, obviously it's a dramatic change from the past. Has it gone too far? Absolutely. Did it grow simply because Congress wanted it to grow? Absolutely not. If Pat Moynihan comes here, when Pat Moynihan comes here, uh, I am sure that he will spend at least a little bit of time talking about one of his major theses, which is called the Iron Law of Emulation. Namely that government institutions competing for shared powers, which is what we have, tend to emulate one another. We first saw the explosion in congressional staff, the real explosion in congressional staff, in the immediate post-war era, the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1946, as Congress responded to the massive increase in the federal bureaucracy and the presidency that had occurred during the World War II era, and indeed in the Roosevelt period before that even. We saw the next major expansion of congressional bureaucracy and staff starting in January of 1969 when Richard Nixon got inaugurated as president and faced a Democratic Congress. And indeed, if you look at the size of the White House staff and the executive office of the president, as it began to grow and it was revolutionized in the Nixon era, White House staff, which had been the core White House staff, 30 or 40 under Roosevelt, had grown gradually to about 175 to 200 around the time of, uh, of uh, Eisenhower and then Truman and stayed fairly much at that level, growing just slightly and incrementally through the Johnson era, went from roughly 200 people to over 500 people in a very short period of time under Richard Nixon as he felt the need to build up his own resources and defenses against a hostile bureaucracy, not to mention a hostile Congress. The executive office of the president, which is the broader arm around the president that includes the uh, original Bureau of the Budget, the National Security Council, the Council on Environmental Quality, and many other uh, outfits, more than tripled during the Nixon era. And we saw other substantive changes. The uh, Budget Bureau was called the Bureau of the Budget from its inception in 1921 until Richard Nixon's presidency when it changed into the Office of Management and Budget. It wasn't just a change in name, it was a change in focus and mission. It moved from being a fairly nonpartisan group of people, largely with green eye shades, who were there to oversee spending in the executive branch as an accounting operation would do, into a policy arm designed to oversee regulations, to write regulations, to ride herd on a hostile bureaucracy, and to transform the budget into much more of a document for setting and arguing over national priorities. And it expanded sharply in size. So too did we see the National Security Council grow substantially in size as Richard Nixon tried to gain control over foreign policy from a State Department bureaucracy and centralize it more in the National Security Council, the White House itself, under Henry Kissinger. As these operations grew, Congress grew its own bureaucracy. And we see Moynihan's Iron Law of Emulation working very well there. They, they moved together almost in concert. As Congress saw a threat to its own prerogatives or its own priorities, it expanded its operation, believing that it was dealing with an executive branch which was arguing that it had a monopoly of information, an ability to use automated processes to get that information, control over expertise, and Congress said we're not gonna let that happen if it's in a way that we see as dangerous to our own ideas and prerogatives. We're gonna grow our own expertise. We're gonna get our own computers. We're gonna build our own uh, uh, weapons to deal with these particular threats. Once it began, it was difficult to stop, and it clearly has overextended itself, even though we have seen a pattern of uh, very small growth or even no growth in the congressional bureaucracy in the last several years. That's after it reached the size of uh, the Titanic uh, and uh, basically outgrew every building uh, possible to build uh, on Capitol Hill for the short term. But clearly now, far more is done by staff than ever used to be the case, with far more autonomy given to that staff, with far more decisions made by staff that are never vetted by their superiors than we have seen before. And I would add one little footnote here uh, to get back on a little hobby horse that I rode uh, some earlier in meeting with the Ashbrook Scholars. If you imagine that by limiting the terms of legislators, 
you are going to limit the power of Congress under these circumstances. With roughly 31,000 staff that work for the institution and on the uh, uh, work of the institution, uh, you are sorely mistaken. The power simply moves down even more from the elected representatives to the staff. There are other ways of trying to uh, deal with this power that would be more effective and that wouldn't be counterproductive in the process. Finally, let me say one characteristic of uh, bureaucracies, as I suggested earlier, is strong and enforceable norms. And in this sense, too, Congress was more bureaucratic, quote unquote, 10, 15 years ago than it is now. We used to write about, as political scientists, the easily recognizable norms that existed in the institution. Freshmen were seen and not heard. You did not speak ill of another member on the floor. You did not make reference to the other body except as the other body on the floor, and so on. Deference to seniors, deference to authority was enforceable because basically the only career path for members of Congress as they came in was right up through the institution. You couldn't travel anywhere without getting approval by the leadership. Basically, you couldn't get decent committee assignments or uh, uh, have any kind of a role to play or have any kind of bill go anywhere or achieve any kind of stature in the political process without having a leadership that uh, was willing to uh, uh, give you some slack. When Sam Rayburn, as speaker, used to say to all of his freshman classes to get along, go along, it had some meaning back then. Well, Congress is much less bureaucratized in that sense now because there are no norms anymore. You can not only get ahead but make a major career for yourself by regularly sticking your thumb in the eye of uh, the leader or the leaders who exist around the institution. You can become a major national figure and build a power base of your own outside the institution while keeping a base inside the institution. You can even, as Newt Gingrich has proven, be a member of the formal leadership and be as far outside the system of norms and the hierarchy of leadership as anybody can. You can simultaneously, at least for a brief period of time, coexist as insider and outsider and try and build your bases in both places. You can become a lion in Georgetown dinner parties, a regular performer on uh, Sunday television talk shows while rebelling against the leaders, the sorts of things that simply didn't exist many years ago. And it'll be a while before we get back to any kind of regularity of norms and behavior uh, for freshmen or for others in the institution, as has been the case, I might say, in many other institutions around the country for a long time. So Congress is, at one and the same time, a curious mix of deliberative body and bureaucracy, at one and the same time both and neither. But let me say that despite the way the question has been worded, is Congress a deliberative body or a bureaucracy, it's not exactly an either or question. While in some respects Congress was more of a bureaucracy 30 years ago with seniority and predictability and norms and less of a deliberative body, back when you didn't have C-SPAN and you didn't have many members on the floor debating things. Basically now, it's neither. And it's going through an identity crisis which is only gonna be exacerbated by its failure to come to grips with policy issues in uh, the uh, past couple of years and the battering that it has taken, partly as a result of that and partly preceding all of that and partly helping to cause the delays and deadlocks that have taken place over the last couple of years. This has been an extremely unhappy period for members of Congress. The public is angry and upset with Congress. There aren't very many members of Congress who are sitting back smugly and saying, well, what do we care, things are just great. I have never seen in 20 years of closely watching the institution more angst and unhappiness that's been there for more than two years. Think about why. If you asked any member of Congress, would have been the highlights of the 101st Congress since George Bush's election? That person would say, well, let's see, let's go back. We start with the pay raise. Two months of nonstop, overwhelming public vilification of us, no doubt partly ripped up by Ralph Nader and radio talk show hosts, but obviously tapping into a genuine uh, disgust out there that questioned our motives, our backgrounds, even our parentage, and in the end, we didn't get it. Now while all that was going on, we had John Tower come forward as a nominee for Secretary of Defense. While many of us, this member would say, despise the man, others of us uh, at least liked his policies, the fact is we had a precedent set there that we would consider a high government post not on the basis of policies, but on the basis of personal sexual behavior or drinking habits, 
going back a decade or more. And we would rely on rumor and innuendo as much as we would on any kinds of facts. We would rely on all kinds of things that had no direct attachment of private life to public performance that would have implications for future decisions. Nobody on either side of the Capitol, on either side of the aisle, came away from the Tower affair feeling good about it. Lots of people thought he never should have been nominated and were delighted to see him go down. Many whom he had uh, uh, stepped on when he was at the top felt very good about stepping on him as he uh, began to come down, but they didn't feel good in the aftermath because of the taste that it left. And of course, as part of this, we went from a press which had had for a long period of time the self-imposed standard, the only kinds of standards we can have with a free press, oh, that's a rumor, we don't print that unless we have independent verification from two sources, to the following standard. We just heard a hint about an innuendo about a rumor, let's go with it on the front page, above the fold. If it's not true, we'll worry about it later. That also leaves everybody in public life uneasy and it ought to leave all of us in private life who are concerned about what kinds of people we get in public life uh, uneasy. Now from John Tower, we segued very quickly into Jim Wright. Went through months of agonizing and for the first time in American history, a Speaker of the House of Representatives resigned from office under a cloud on the verge of being removed from office directly. Soon after that, Tony Quello, the third ranking Democratic leader, resigned under a similar cloud. We moved from there through Buzz Lukens and Gus Savage, through uh, the uh, indictment and conviction of Mario Biaggi in the WedTech scandal and later Robert Garcia, through Barney Frank, uh, on through and up to the Keating Five, now being considered, David Durnberger, censured uh, effectively uh, by uh, the Senate of the United States and other investigations continuing to be ongoing. And of course, mixed in with that was the aftermath of the Iran-Contra affair with the trials and the appeals and the continuation. The HUD scandal, which continues to go on with an independent investigation of uh, former Secretary Samuel Pierce. And all of the uh, rest of the SNL scandal, uh, which moved beyond the Congress uh, to encompass other institutions. You get through all of that. And now finally, the last bookend, Buzz Lukens, who came up at the beginning of the Congress, who now uh, leaves prematurely, uh, before you get to any discussion of policy. And up until the final couple of weeks of this Congress, when some issues will get wrapped up, the only significant piece of legislation passed during the last two years was an extension of the minimum wage. Now we get the budget, and we may get the Clean Air Act, and we may get a few other things, but obviously this has not been a Congress dominated by deliberation over policy. It's been one that has been gripped by stories of personal scandal, uh, malfeasance, nonfeasance, and misfeasance, ethics questions, campaign finance, and honoraria, and uh, 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 all of the things related to that. That began long before we had gridlock over the budget that uh, characterized an institution uh, that feels besieged from outside. And long before the public of instance discussed with Congress as an institution in the way it is now, indeed the irony is that when we had uh, an era of people feeling very good about themselves and their country, peace and prosperity reigned in most of 1989. This focus on personal scandal came about in significant part because the big issues of American political life, the economy, and where we might be heading in our own jobs and our own livelihoods, the international world where we might be gripped by questions of a crisis or the possibility of a war weren't there. Peace and prosperity reigned. Those big ticket issues weren't there, dominating the political landscape and dialogue. And what filled that vacuum, because it created a vacuum when those issues aren't there churning up people's guts, was personal scandal. Could have been filled by a president who was active and moving and out there dominating the landscape with his own agenda. That's not George Bush. When George Bush came into the presidency, he didn't want to come up with an agenda of detailed policy saying, here's what I want to do and I want to do it right now. His instinct is to sit back and wait to issue broad principles. I'm the education president, I'm the environmental president, I want a clean air act, now you work with the details and do it at your own pace not to say, I want this proposal done and I want it now. So he didn't fill the vacuum. A strong congressional leadership aggressively could have filled that vacuum. Jim Wright did so in the last two years of the Reagan administration. When he first became speaker, clean water, highways, trade, South African sanctions, all 
his priorities, congressional priorities, pushed right from the beginning Ronald Reagan back on the defensive in his lame duck period. But Jim Wright was concerned about his own neck, not about priorities in 1989 uh, as uh, the Congress started. And a new Senate leader, George Mitchell, was just trying to grope his way through to figure out what to do as a leader. So that vacuum was filled with a cultural theme that we've tended to pursue for a long period of time. We just love to find people in positions of power and show their feet of clay. Now, if you think about the last couple of years, we've done that in almost every walk of life. Think about uh, the world of uh, sports to start with. What have been the stories of the last few years? Pete Rose, Steve Garvey, Wade Boggs, NC State, drugs, gambling, scandal, sex, uh, bribery, and so forth. Those have been dominant themes. Think about the world of religion. It's been the televangelists. Think about the world of business. The best seller uh, in the business world in the last two years has been barbarians at the gate. It's been stories about leverage buyouts, greed on Wall Street, Michael Milken, Ivan Boesky. The world of entertainment, it's been Rob Lowe and Zsa Zsa Gabor. The world that encompasses finance, entertainment, religion, sports, uh, and all the rest of it. Donald and Ivana Trump, the big story of the decade. Uh, that's what's dominated the news in the last few years, and politicians have been caught up in that and have been, of course, an even more major, major focal point because they wield power over all of us in a more formal fashion. But it's left people feeling battered and bruised, uneasy, and as a consequence, skittish, and feeling unable to get out on a limb or to act, more concerned with what might happen with a 30-second hit-and-run ad campaign that could be used against him that would take advantage of all of this, negative campaigns that have worked more in the last few years because people believe anything about politicians. Uh, they're used because they work. And people unwilling to get out there and lead. In the absence of proactive leadership anywhere, we're asking questions about Congress that aren't usually at the polite level of is this a deliberative body or a bureaucracy. And we are going to go through a very sizable debate, which will undoubtedly include some proposals for radical reform in the next few years that I hope will not get so out of hand that we'll do some things that we'll come to regret later on. And with that, let me stop, and uh, we can uh, perhaps open up for some uh, give and take. Thank you very much.